So let me ask you this morning, when you think of the word extraordinary, what comes to your mind? Think about that for just a second. When you think about extraordinary, what comes to your mind? There's a couple of things, and I just wrote down some things that come to my mind. First of all, I think of an extraordinary dessert. Have you ever eaten one of those? I mean, just a, just a dessert that, you know, make you, uh, you know, just want to bite your tongue. I mean, it's, it's, so, uh, it's so good. Some of you have made those desserts for me. And I want you to know, as a family, we gladly receive those desserts. And so if you need, if you need somebody to try out, we'd be one of those people that you can try out. Maybe an extraordinary dessert. Maybe it was a movie that was just over the top. It's one of those movies that, that, that you're willing to watch over and over again. I normally don't watch a movie more than once, but, but there's several movies that are extraordinary to me, and, and I enjoy watching them repeatedly. Maybe it's an extraordinary person, someone that had an unforgettable impact on your life. And you'd sit back and say, boy, that person is not ordinary why that person is extraordinary. Well, I, I don't know what you think about when we think about the word extraordinary, but I have a sneaking suspicion that when God thinks about the term extraordinary, he thinks about you and he thinks about me. Now, now don't get me wrong. He doesn't think we're extraordinary because of who we are or what we have or what we can offer to him. No, he thinks of you and me as being extraordinary because of who we can become in Jesus Christ. You see, God has a desire of moving each and every one of us from the ordinary to the extraordinary. God has a desire of, of taking our lives and using our lives in a spectacular way. We see that illustrated in the passage of Scripture that we're studying this morning. And so we're in Luke chapter 6. I'm going to read just four or five verses, beginning in verse 12. Would you follow with me? I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. You can, you can follow along on the screen if you have a different translation or didn't bring your Bibles. Verse 12. One day soon afterward, Jesus went up on a mountain to pray. And he prayed to God all night. At daybreak, he called together all of his disciples and chose 12 of them to be apostles. Here are their names. Simon, who he surnamed Peter. Andrew, Peter's brother. If you know the story, Peter brought his brother Andrew to Jesus, James and John, the sons of thunder, they were brothers. Then Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, you're familiar with Thomas, he's often referred to as doubting Thomas because he doubted the resurrection of Jesus. James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called a zealot. When you think about the diversity, you have Simon the zealot and you have Matthew the tax collector that were on two different sides of the political spectrum. Simon, who was called the zealot. Judas, son of James. If you notice in Matthew or Mark, he's called Thaddeus. He's often referred to as the three-named disciple because he's found by three different names in Scripture. And then Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him. Before we pray, just a couple interesting things. Um, you'll notice that any list you find, whether it's in Matthew, Mark, or Luke, always begins with Simon Peter, always ends with Judas Iscariot. There's three different groupings, and the groupings are always the same. The first grouping is Peter, Andrew, James, and John. They're always together, though the order might be different. Those four are always together, and they would be considered the primary group. The next group would be Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, and Thomas, and those four are always together in a grouping. And then lastly, the last four are always together, the ones that we know the least about, 
James the son of Alphaeus, Simon who was the zealot, Judas, and Judas Iscariot, and you'll notice in parentheses every time Judas Iscariot's name is mentioned, the one who later betrayed Jesus. This is a remarkable list. These are the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles, 12 ordinary men that God took and used in an extraordinary way. And what an example they are to us that not only could God take them and use them in an extraordinary way, but God can take us and use us in an extraordinary way as well. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, as we look at your word, I pray that you'd help us to be reminded of the truths of your word. Thank you so much that in our worship time, we've been able to sing about, we've been able to think about, we've been able to worship Jesus Christ, who who is the only one that is worthy of our worship. And so, Father, we thank you for him today, and we thank you that he is the one who calls us. He is the one who equips us and enables us, and he is the one that we serve. So, Lord, as we study these 12 guys today, Father, I pray that you'd help us to see our lives in their lives. Help us to see our flaws in their flaws. Help us to see our potential in their potential and help us to realize that just as you use them you desire to use us Lord thank you for what you're doing in our lives thank you for the salvation that we have only through Jesus Christ thank you for the life changing power that you give us so speak to our hearts this morning in Jesus name we pray amen so we're we're quickly advancing in our story of Jesus' life and ministry. Last week, you'll remember, we were, in, we were in chapter four and kind of bounced over a little bit, but we were in chapter four, and last week we studied his purpose statement in which Jesus declared his intentions to minister to the brokenhearted, the blind, and the oppressed. And, and we were challenged to make sure that our own personal mission statement lines up with his. I was so encouraged. Some of you really encouraged me this week as you sent me via email or Facebook your mission statement saying, Pastor Brian, this is what I want God to do with my life. You see, God has a purpose for your life and God desires to use you and God desires to use me, but it's important that our mission is in line with his. As we come to today's passage, we find that Jesus has been involved in public ministry now for more than a year. It's interesting when you study the the life and ministry of Jesus. Now, especially after he'd been ministering for a year, his popularity ratings were much like a second-term president. You say, Brian, what do you mean by that? Why, in the beginning, Jesus was extremely popular. I mean, if, if Gallup and all those would have tracked the popularity and, you know, the positive image that Jesus had, it would have been way up there. He started out extremely popular, but he is now receiving much opposition from the religious establishment. And although Jesus is a little more than a year and a half away from his pending death, Jesus is beginning to feel the heat in his ministry. He knew that in order for his ministry to extend beyond his life, and he knew that he came to die, so he knew that within a short period of time he would be dying upon the cross, and he knew in order that, or in order for his ministry to carry on beyond his death, that Jesus would need to select, train, and commission a group of men that would follow in his footsteps. That's what takes place in today's passage. Jesus takes 12 ordinary men that eventually impact the world. Let me pause for a second because when we think of the 12 disciples, they're kind of like heroes for us. I mean, if we ask you, okay, who are the spiritual leaders in all of history? 
Man, we talk about the 12 disciples. I've been in, in you know, ornate cathedrals around the world, and you see, in these ornate cathedrals around the world, you see the pictures of the 12 disciples all around us. And, and we have a tendency to think that when Jesus selected them, that he selected the cream of the crop, that he selected the most educated, the most talented, guys that were, that were trained and ready to change the world. But that simply is not the case. You see, one of the most amazing truths about the propagation of the gospel and the founding of the church is that God chose ordinary people. God used ordinary men to accomplish something extraordinary. And so today, as we look at their call in in Luke chapter 6, what are some things that that we can learn and we can put in our pocket and we can can kind of pull back out later in the week and we can apply to our lives? Notice several things that I wrote down in my notes. The first is this. It is God, or specifically here Jesus, that calls people to serve him. It it is Jesus that calls people to serve him. This is one of those passages that I remember studying as as a little boy. How many of you grew up in Sunday school? Any any of you grew up in in Sunday school? All right, a good number. Remember, Remember studying this passage in Sunday school and talking about the 12 disciples? This was one of my favorite passages when I was growing up. Uh, I remember someone wrote a a little song about these guys to remember their names. And I tried my best to remember the song this week, and I can't remember the song. The only thing is I can remember the last line. And the last little bit goes, Philip, Thomas, Matthew, and Bartholomew. That's all I can remember. If somebody remembers the rest of the song, would you come and sing it to me at the conclusion of the service? Because I tried to think about it all week long. No doubt, up till now, these guys had been a part of the crowd. They'd been following Jesus. As a matter of fact, a couple of chapters before, Jesus had come to some of them and he said, hey, come and follow me. And these guys with the crowd, with the multitude, had been following Jesus. They'd been listening to Jesus' message. They had been observing. They had been absorbing. They were faces in the crowd. But here in this passage, Jesus calls them out. And he calls them to be his disciples and his apostles. Notice several things that I wrote down that are interesting to me. The first is this. The disciples were chosen spiritually. And I want you to see verse 12 once again to understand what is taking place. It says, one day soon afterward, Jesus had been doing ministry, he'd been healing people, and one day soon afterward, Jesus went up on a mountain to pray. The text doesn't tell us which mountain it was. He went up on a mountain to pray. And he prayed all night to God. And so we find that, that the most interesting thing, or one of the most interesting things to me is, is what Jesus did. How Jesus chose these guys spiritually. It says that Jesus went up on a mountaintop to pray. Now, we know that prayer wasn't out of the ordinary for Jesus. In the first five chapters of Luke, we find that that prayer was an integral part of Jesus' life. Luke chapter 5 and verse 16 says this, but Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. But here it tells us something interesting. It says that he spent all night long in prayer. And and the Greek word that's used for all night is a really interesting word. It's a word that has the idea of basically from from sundown to sun up. And so it wasn't like he watched TV till 1 o'clock in the morning, prayed for a couple hours, and then the sun was coming up. No, the idea in the passage was that Jesus labored in prayer all night long. Now, I remember reading that several years ago and sitting back wondering, what was Jesus praying about? Uh, I mean, think about that. What what would Jesus have prayed for for 10 hours? 
you read commentary, some suggest what Jesus was praying, that God would give him the wisdom and the omniscience to know who to select because the next morning he was going to select his 12 disciples. But I would remind you that Jesus is omniscient God. And Jesus already knew the will of the Father. It wasn't like he was sitting back saying, boy, should I select this guy or this guy? Should I select them from this area or for this, from this area? He was omniscient God. He knew who he was going to select. So what in the world was Jesus praying for? I believe with all of my heart that he wasn't praying about the men that he would choose. Rather, he was praying for the men he would choose. Wrap your mind around that for just a second. Before Jesus called these 12 guys, he spent all night praying for them. To me, that's remarkable. By the way, just as he prayed for them, be assured of the fact that Jesus prays for you and for me as well. You see, these guys were chosen spiritually. Here's a second term, and we've used this term repeatedly in recent weeks, but the disciples were chosen sovereignly. They not only were chosen spiritually, they were chosen sovereignly. Notice in verse 13, it says, At daybreak, he called together all of his disciples, and then, lost the mic, there we go, and chose 12 of them. So the idea is that there's this, the, there's this large multitude of disciples that have been following him. And so after spending the night in prayer, Jesus calls all of his followers together. And from that contingent of followers, he sovereignly called out 12 of them. Recently, we've spoken much about the term sovereign. The term sovereignty, it means that he has full knowledge and that he is in complete control. You say, so Brian, when you talk about the fact that, that Jesus chose them sovereignly, what does that mean? Let me give you two thoughts that I wrote down in my notes. The first thought is this. God chose them before they chose him. Let me say that again. God chose them before they chose him. Here's not, here's not what took place that morning. Jesus didn't stand up in front of the followers and say, okay, team, here's what we need. I need 12 people that will step up and be my disciples. I need 12 guys that will follow me around for the next 18 months, that will kind of leave their families and dedicate their lives to, to ministering to me and to what I have. Anybody here willing to do that? And Jesus sat back just hoping that 12 people would raise their hands. That's not what took place. The idea is that that Jesus sovereignly chose them. And he chose them before they chose him. Here's a great verse. I believe it's in your notes, John 15, 16. Jesus said this, You didn't choose me, rather I chose you. And so that process was begun, not other than by Jesus Christ himself. And by the way, that's the way he chooses us as well. We love him, why? Because he first loved us. It's not like we reach out to him first. No, God does a work of grace in our lives that draws us to him. The second thing that I wrote down is this. God chose them not because of who they were, but because of who they could be. Catch that. God chose them not because of who they were, but because of who they could be. That's so encouraging to me. Because in the same way, Jesus looks at me, and he doesn't see me for who I am. He sees me for who I can become. You see, God sees, and God chooses differently. Think with me this morning. We see a lump of clay. God sees a beautiful vase. We see a blank canvas. God sees a finished painting. We see a lump of coal. God sees a refined diamond. We see problems. 
God sees solutions. We see failures. God sees potential success. You see, we see Jacob, but God sees Israel. We see Simon, but God looks at Simon and says, no, I'm not going to call you Simon. I'm going to call you Peter. Because, man, you're going to be one of the leaders of my church. You see, here's the idea. God can take an ordinary person and do something extraordinary in their lives. Jesus didn't choose the disciples because they were great. Rather, their greatness came as a result of Jesus choosing them and the Holy Spirit of God empowering them. As I mentioned, in the same way, God didn't choose you because you were great. You're not. Neither am I. Yet in God's grace and in God's mercy, God can do something wonderful in my life and in yours. As I look out across our congregation this morning, I see a group of people whose lives are being changed by the power of the gospel. I see people who were lumps of clay, and God is molding and shaping you into a beautiful vase. I see individuals that were just a blank canvas, and God is painting a beautiful picture, which is your life. I see individuals that were lumps of coal, but God is making a diamond out of your life. And you are beginning to shine and glow for him. You see, God chooses us just as he chose the disciples. They were chosen spiritually. They were chosen sovereignly. I I wrote down a third thing here. They were chosen specifically. Notice, Notice verse 13 once again. He says, at daybreak he called together all of his disciples and he chose 12 of them. Did you ever wonder why he chose 12? Do you ever wonder why I didn't say, okay, I want eight of you guys, or I want 24 of you to come forward? What was the significance? What was the purpose of 12? Well, obviously, if you've read much of the Bible, the number 12 is filled with symbolic importance. There were 12 tribes of Israel in the Old Testament, but we realize that when Jesus was ministering, Israel had become apostate. The Judaism of Jesus' day represented not a solid faith, not a biblical faith, but a corrupt faith. The Israelites had strayed from God in favor of a works religion. So here's what Jesus is doing. Jesus basically is rejecting that corrupt works-based religion of Judaism, and he's establishing a new way. He's certainly not establishing a new religion, but he's establishing Christianity built upon the foundation of Judaism. And so here's what I wrote down in my notes. The choosing of the 12 was a judgment against institutionalized Judaism. Jesus intentionally, now you don't think the crowds that were listening to him when all of a sudden he said 12 disciples, you don't think that rang a bell with some of them? that they sat back and said, no, wait a second, weren't there 12 tribes in Israel before? And and didn't we have leaders over each of those tribes? They would have caught the symbolism. and They would have known exactly what Jesus was doing and what Jesus was saying. That number would have been evident to almost every Israelite. It was a bold indictment against the 12 tribes of Israel. But I wrote down a second thing that goes right in line with that. The choosing of the 12 was selection of a new leadership for a new covenant. You see, Jesus was, to a certain degree, he wasn't rejecting the old covenant because he himself would be a fulfillment of the old covenant. But Jesus was establishing a new covenant that now would be sealed and ratified by his blood. And by the establishment of that new covenant, Jesus was beginning a brand new organism that would be the church. And Jesus is saying, with this organism, needs new leadership. The apostles represented a whole new Israel. Jesus was bypassing traditional Judaism 
and Jesus would establish a new covenant. As I mentioned, a covenant that would be ratified by his blood. And by the way, a covenant in which Jews and Gentiles could participate. And those of us who are Gentiles this morning ought to give a hearty amen. Because were it not for the new covenants, man, we'd have a hard time entering in. You say, Brian, could I not have been a Gentile and become a Jew? You could have, but it will require a little bit of a delicate surgery that we're not going to talk about on the platform this morning. All right? But now in Jesus Christ, both Jews and Gentiles become a part of what? The exact same body. And Jesus is sitting back saying, you know what, man, we are forming something new. And these disciples are going to be the leaders of that new covenant. Here's what I want you to see. God calls people. It was God, it was Jesus Christ that reached down and specifically called each of these men. I want you to see a second thing, and and this encouraged me. The second thing is this. God calls people imperfect people to serve him God not only calls people but God Jesus calls imperfect people to serve him you see one of the cool things about the 12 disciples is they are men with whom you and I can identify Have you ever been reading through the New Testament and you see, you know, whether it's Peter, you know, respond in a certain way or John respond in a certain way and you kind of chuckle under your breath because you sit back and you think Well, that sounds like something I would have done. (laughs) Or I would have responded that way. Or I would have gotten mad in that situation. And as I read through the lives of these disciples, I see myself in their lives. Uh, I mean, I say all the time, I am so much like impetuous Peter that it's unbelievable. Not his good characteristics, but his bad characteristics. Peter spoke before he ever thought And I do that all the time. And I see myself, my humanity in their lives. These guys weren't royalty. These guys weren't geniuses. They were normal men. Notice several things that I wrote down. First of all, the disciples were ordinary men. Not one of them was renowned for his scholarship or education. They had, they had no track record as, as theologians or great orators. They had no outstanding talents other than being fishermen or tradesmen. They had no outstanding abilities. John MacArthur says this. He says that their most outstanding characteristic was their ordinariness. They were ordinary. They were just like you and me. You say, Brian, what do you mean? Well, first of all, they were from Galilee, As a matter of fact, if you do a study, 11 of them were from Galilee. The only one that wasn't from Galilee was Judas Iscariot. But they were from Galilee, and the Galileans were deemed low-class, rural, uneducated people. I find it interesting that Jesus didn't go to Jerusalem, the capital, the hub, didn't go to the main places of education and say, give me 12 of your brightest men. That's not who Jesus looked for called 12 guys 11 of them were from Galilee for the most part they were blue collar guys the majority were fishermen at least five were fishermen many believe that seven were fishermen some were craftsmen some were tradesmen here's what I want you to catch they were ordinary people just like you and me you know what these guys did they put their pants on one leg at a time if they wore pants They put them on one leg at a time. They were just like us. They were ordinary men, but catch this. The disciples were not just ordinary men. The disciples were flawed men. You see, this was a a ragtag bunch that needed a lot of work. They had many flaws. You sit back and say, okay, Brian, what were, what were the flaws they had? Let me mention several in your notes. First of all, they lack spiritual understanding. As I mentioned before, these weren't theologians. These guys lacked spiritual understanding. They were slow to hear. They were slow to understand. At times, they were thick-headed. At times, they were dull. Some Bible writers even define them as being spiritually stupid. <laughs> 
all right? There, there were times, and Jesus repeatedly looked at them in the New Testament and said, don't you get what I'm talking about? I mean, they would see the miracles, they would hear the teaching, and at times, they just didn't get it. It didn't sink into them. They lacked spiritual understanding. They lacked humility. <laughs> As I read through the New Testament, I'm amazed. they spent an enormous amount of time arguing over who would be the greatest. I mean, imagine that. They're traveling with Jesus. They just heard Jesus preach this great message, and you know, they're rejoicing in the responses. And As Jesus is walking along, several of them are walking a few paces, paces behind him, and basically their conversation is this. You know, when we get to heaven, I'm going to be more important than you are. And I think I'm going to sit a little bit closer to Jesus than uh, you are. I sit back and think, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, they're walking with Jesus, and they lack what? They lack humility. So I read through the New Testament, at times they sound like a bunch of adolescent boys arguing over their accomplishments. Whose daddy is greater and who is stronger? They lacked humility. Luke 9, 46 says, then the disciples began arguing about which of them was the greatest. They lacked faith. Four times in the Gospel of Matthew alone, Jesus reprimands them for their lack of faith. I gave you those texts. They lacked commitment. Think with me this morning, while the crowds were cheering, they were right there in the midst of it. When Jesus came in in his triumphal entry and the crowds were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, man, the disciples were there in all of Jesus' glory and you can imagine in all of their glory as well. But when the, disciple, or when the soldiers showed up at the Garden of Gethsemane to arrest Jesus, what happened to those loyal disciples? They took off, man. They, they skedaddled out of there. They left. They lacked commitment. They fled for their lives. Mark 14, 50, then all his disciples deserted him and ran away. Fifthly, they lacked power. On their own, they were weak, helpless, especially when they had to confront the enemy. There were times that they tried to cast out demons but were unable to do so. Write down this text, Matthew 17, 14 through 19 is a great example. Here's a demon-possessed boy and the disciples tried to cast him out and they couldn't and they come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, listen, man, we just can't do it. Why? And Jesus meant, man, it's just your lack of faith. Your lack of faith demonstrates a lack of power. Now listen, church, I read through those flaws, and I'm encouraged. You say, what are you talking about, Brian? Those are the, those are the guys upon which the church is built. That's the foundation. Exactly, exactly. I read about their flaws, and I'm encouraged because I am just like them. I can be dull and I can be spiritually stupid at times. I can be. There's a lot of times my wife would tell you that I just lack humility. I lack faith. I lack power. I lack commitment in my life. But I'm encouraged by the fact that if God can use them, God can use me. If God can use those disciples, if Jesus can take that bunch of guys and train them and retrain them and use them, man, there's hope for Brian this morning. And there is hope for you. Be encouraged by the fact that Jesus chooses the humble. Jesus chooses the mistake prone. Jesus chooses the weak. You say, Brian, why does he do that? So that there's not ever a question as to where the power comes from. The power doesn't come from us. It's not because of who we are. It is all because of who he is. And if God accomplishes anything in my life or in your life, it's not because of who we are. It's to him and to him alone deserves all the glory. That's the case with the disciples. And he chose this group of ordinary, flawed guys.
Let me show you a third thing today. The third thing is this. God calls teachable people. Jesus calls teachable people to serve him. Although these guys had their faults, their character flaws, and even a lack of courage, they were trainable. Before they were sent out to teach, they needed to be taught. And and basically, as we go through the book of Luke, you're going to see uh, Jesus' training of these 12 disciples. You talk about a seminary education. And by the way, they had basically 18 months was all they had for him to do a transformation in their lives that would transform them so that they in turn could transform the world. Two things I wrote down. The first is this, Jesus personally trained them. He personally trained them. You say, Brian, how did he train them? Well, he trained them in so many ways. They, they observed his miracles. They observed his actions. They heard his teaching. But I want you to catch this verse because I think this verse illustrates it as much as any. Notice with me in Mark chapter 3 and verse 14. I love this. And this is, a, I think this is the translation out of the New King James, but I, I love this. Mark chapter 3 and verse 14, it says this. Then he appointed 12 that they might be with him. Catch that for just a second. He appointed them that they might be with him. You see, their main avenue, their main vehicle of of preparation and training was simply spending time with Jesus. As a matter of fact, if you you know, read later on, and it talks about these guys. It says that as they began to preach and teach and do miracles, it makes this statement, the people could tell that they had been with Jesus. Isn't that a great thought? You see, if we're not spending any time with him, we're certainly not able to be trained by him. If you're not in the word, if you're not putting yourself under the teaching of the word, if you're not spending time with him, there's no way that God can take your ordinary life and turn it into something extraordinary. Jesus took these 12 guys and used 18 months to train them for the momental task for which they were called. Think about this. I thought about this this week. There was no second string It's not like, well, you know what, if these guys don't cut it, we got somebody else that's going to come in. There was no plan B if these 12 should fail. He was completely depending upon them to be successful. How were they successful? Here's the second thing that I wrote down. They were empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. They were empowered by the Holy Spirit. You see, when Jesus came and died on the cross, it seemed as if his training program failed. Think about that. I, I, I mentioned just a moment ago, when, when Jesus was there in the garden of Gethsemane, what happened to those guys? Man, they took off. And the text says that they took off, and many of them went back. When Jesus died, they went back to their former occupations. They went back to being fishermen. They went back to being tradesmen. They went back to being craftsmen. Man, and and and. An observer would sit back and say, boy, that failed. <laughs> 18 months to prepare those guys, and man, what you, you put them in a crucible of, of persecution, and what happens? Boom, they take off. But then Jesus rose from the dead. And when Jesus rose from the dead, they realized and they saw that everything that Jesus had preached and prophesied became true. And in Acts chapter 1, that, that handful of believers is in the upper room And it says that the Holy Spirit of God came upon them. And the Holy Spirit empowered them. And those guys that lacked spiritual understanding, that lacked humility, that lacked faith, that lacked commitment, that lacked power, were the men that God used to change the world. You see, the simple truth is God loves taking the ordinary and using it in an extraordinary way. And just as God called them, God calls you. My fourth point, really simple, there's nothing underneath it. The fourth point is this. God is calling you to serve. 
He said, Ryan, you mean he wants me to be a disciple? Absolutely. Does he want me to be an apostle? No, I don't believe he wants you to be an apostle, but I believe he wants you to be a disciple. And I believe that God has a work that he desires for each and every one of you to do. And wouldn't it be cool if Jesus personally would come this morning and he would say, okay, we're going to take just a few minutes. Al, here's what I want you to do. Dennis, here's what I want you to do. Mark, here's what I want you to do. And he personally said that. I guarantee you that he's got a job for each and every Every one of us. For some of us, it's working in Hope House. For some of us, it's working with Hope Women's Centers. For others of us, it's working in uh, the Open Heart Food Pantry. For others of us, it's using our gifts to serve. But I guarantee you, God has a purpose for you. And just as God called the disciples, He's calling you. And He's asking you to step out, to be willing to be used of God and to serve him. John chapter 20 and verse 21, Jesus said this, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Here's the question today. Are you trainable? Are you usable? Do you desire for God to use you. I promise you this morning, if you respond to his call, if you say just like Isaiah, here I am, Lord, you send me, I promise you, God will train you. And if you'll surrender, God will empower you. And God will use you to accomplish something for which only he can get the credit and the honor and the glory. God is calling you to serve. Will you answer the call?